So what does a data science consultant charge? In this video, I'm gonna cover three different roles, data engineer, machine learning engineer, and data scientist. Now, you're probably here because you have Googled what should I charge and you've come up with trash. Why is everything out there so bad? It's because it's based on these salary surveys that are done by job boards. These job boards are pandering to employers. They want to give these lower salary numbers because that's what makes employers happy. So they are, I mean, if you look at their survey methodology, it's bad. The, across the board, you always see these sometimes as much as 50% lower than they should be. And how do they figure out those numbers? I'll be honest, I've looked into it. I, I cannot tell you what sort of massaging they've done on the data to make any of those things show up because they're just so far off. And so that's at the heart of most of the posts that you see out there that'll say, oh yeah, you're going to make anywhere between uh, 50 and 75. No, you're not. No, <laughs> no, that's not even close. That's not right. So how do we in the consulting business figure out what the rates are? Well, I've been doing this for nine years. Been a data science consultant for nine years. I've worked with some of the largest companies in America and I've run into hundreds of other data science consultants and we all kind of do the same thing. We just steal rate cards from the big consulting companies. <laughs> they set the rate in our industry. I mean, it sounds bad, but it's the truth. We all look at their rates and we price ourselves appropriately based on what they charge. So those are the real rates. Those are what all of us and you now too can use to figure out what your pricing should be per hour so that you're not getting underpaid. I mean, if you go on to Upwork, you can see people that are taking $30 an hour and I do not begrudge them a living. If that's how you want to compete, if you wanna go on a platform like Upwork and you want to compete on price, that's fine. But you as a data science consultant are probably not going to be competing against people from Upwork. And you may think you are, but really you're not. If you're discovered through your reputation or through networking, selling on your own, you're in a different category. And so don't compete with the cheapest rates that you can find on the internet. Set your own and do the same thing all the rest of us do. Set them at market rates based on what some of the big players do. Now, the important things to understand, and I'm going to get to probably the most important thing for you to do before you set your rate, which is to figure out what tier you're in. Now, every consulting company has a, a number of tiers. The majority of them have five. So you're level one, and this is all based on years of experience for the most part. And I'll get into a little more detailed explanation right after this, but level one is a year of experience. Level two is three years of experience. Level three is five. Level four is seven. And level five is 12 or anything above 12 years of experience. Some do 10 years of experience, some do 12, but 12 is pretty standard. Now, that's not the only thing that goes into your level. The other things that can go into your level are things like having a PhD for a data scientist is big. So if you have a PhD, you can actually bump yourself by a level because of just the PhD that you have. So if you are a PhD with two years of experience, feel free to market yourself as a level three. And that's pretty common is that the PhD will push you up at least one level. And if it's from a top tier university, or if you did some significant research, you're actually probably going to go up more than one level based on your pedigree, based on your history and your education. Also look at experience that you got outside of the field. That could be software development. That can be as a data analyst or any number of different roles can give you experience that will count towards the level that you're at. Most consulting companies have sort of this, uh, you know, weird background equation where they'll say this experience substitutes for that experience. But typical rule of thumb that I do is as long as it's rel relative, related to what it is that you do, give yourself about 50%. So if you were a software developer for four years, you've been a data scientist for three years, Give yourself five total years of experience, which is half of your software developer experience. Same thing with data analyst, or like I said, any sort of technical experience that contributes. You can use research assistant, any sort of experience that contributes to what it is that you do. Count that about 50% towards your level. Now, what else can contribute to your level? Well, there's levels and there are also alternate structures. 
What does that mean? So if you're a data scientist, I used to be just the data scientist. And then I got fairly well known and I worked on some really, really cool sort of high profile projects. And that's what propelled me forward into being well known as a consultant in the field. And so I get to charge more. And consulting companies do the same thing. They have alternate structures where you're no longer a data scientist. Sometimes you're a subject matter expert or they'll have different names at different companies. But essentially what it means is you've distinguished yourself above and beyond. And so you can take on more complex projects. You are expected to be more knowledgeable because of some piece of experience that you've had in your background. A lot of times people that have had really high end jobs at a place like Facebook or one of the large tech companies will, and sometimes people coming out of government, you know, have the same sort of de designation because they have an additional background. They have that pedigree that pushes their advice into a more valuable or the work products that they do into a more valuable territory. So those are alternate structures. And like for me, I am a subject matter expert. I also do strategy consulting. And so that's another, even though I'm using heavily relying on my knowledge of data science, I'm also relying on my knowledge of strategy and business strategy and how to build business models around data science and machine learning. So I'm in a slightly different structure. And you have to think of yourself in the same way because consulting companies put people into different structures based on their background. And so if you have additional skills that you want to showcase, think about what alternate structure that might put you in. You also may have multiple rate tiers that you use because you can take on different types of projects. A lot of machine learning engineers could also do data engineering and vice versa. A lot of data engineers can do ML engineering. Some data scientists can do ML engineering as well. And so you might have two different rate tiers based on your capability of taking on a data engineering project, which if you're a machine learning engineer, is probably you're at the high end of the data engineering spectrum, even though you may just be at the mid range of your machine learning engineering level spectrum. So think about it that way. I have two tiers. I have my SME tier and I have my AI strategy tier. And so when I give people a rate card, it's got those two rates depending upon what you need from a project's project perspective. What are you bringing me in to do? So think about that. You want to look at what level are you and which structure do you fall into? Do you fall into your normal traditional data science, data engineer, machine learning engineer, or should you give yourself an alternate designation because you are more capable or you have some type of a pedigree or background that pushes you into one of those alternate structures? So now that you've figured that out and you potentially have more than one rate card, see all of that, more than one rate on your rate card, all of that is going to be the justification for what you get paid. And that's why it's so important to do this little bit of background and categorize yourself. And then on your rate card, put a couple of paragraphs in about why, why are you charging what it is that you're charging and talk about what level you're in. You don't necessarily have to say level, but just use the language, use the experience, your education, your background, other companies that you've worked at, especially if they're well-known names, consulting is a very pedigree driven industry. And so the better your pedigree and background, the better the companies or colleges that you've been associated with, or the cooler the job titles that you've had, the higher your level, your tier, or your structure can be. And so walk through all of those different things, put yourself in the right category, and make sure that that's in your rate card as a justification for each one of the rates you're going to charge. Now, how much money? Let's get down to actual numbers. Now that they're going to make sense. Let's get down to some actual numbers for how much you're going to charge. Well, so for a data science consultant, you're going to see that level two to level four is anywhere between two and 300 an hour. And that's a pretty fixed range. You're going to find most people that have between three and about seven to 10 years of experience, three to 10 years of experience between the $200 to $300 an hour range for machine learning engineers. The bottom end of that range is 225 an hour. The top end of that range, though, is only 275. Machine learning engineers are in this weird place where, for some reason, they're not seen at the top end of the spectrum as the same value as a data scientist. Just is what it is. And data engineer often gets, the lower end of it often gets miscategorized with another 
type of job. And so the data engineer's low end of the, the spectrum is 175 an hour. The high end, you know, that level two, 175 an hour. And the higher end, that level four, actually goes all the way up to about 300 an hour. Why is that? Well, the data engineer, like I said, you're often misclassified as a data engineer into either one, a lower end role, or number two, into a machine learning engineering role. And so you will get the benefit of a data scientist's top end, excuse me, not machine learning engineer, data scientist. You will get the benefit of a data scientist's top end, but unfortunately you also get, I mean, everything from DBA. You can fall into like a high-end DBA category sometimes. And so companies are still coming to terms with what a data engineer is. And so that's why it's that wide swings because sometimes you're misclassified as a data scientist. Sometimes you're misclassified as, you know, a, D a DBA or a, uh, a software developer. And so there's a, there's a fairly wide range and it's worth making it really clear what your value proposition is and going after projects where you're going to be classified appropriately so you can get what you actually deserve to get paid. Now, what about if you're a level five or one of those alternate structures? So here's where it gets difficult to figure out what you should charge because it, you will see consulting companies charge for SMEs 300 to 1,000. Like there is this big, big range. And it's really how much can you get someone to pay? That's what happens when you hit that level five and that senior level is it's really what do you think you can get that person to write a check for? And so obviously it depends on company size. You're not going to be able to, you know, if you're a $300 consultant, $300 an hour consultant, that's at the top end of the range. You're going to be limited to the number of companies that can afford even the top end of the range. But once you break out of that, once you go into the four, five, even $600 an hour range, the number of companies that can afford you and that understand your value proposition becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So it, it's good. You're going to get a higher rate, but Again, there's a downside to it, which means that you're going to have fewer customers that you can approach. Obviously, seed stage startup is probably not bringing you in at 500 an hour to do AI strategy consulting or to do a high-end deep learning project. They're going to try to find someone for that high-end deep learning project who's much, much lower priced. So you are going to limit your opportunities once you hit that top end. However, that's not a bad thing. If you have the background and the pedigree, charging appropriately is a good thing because the customers who can pay, who can afford it, are expecting that rate. They're expecting you to be upwards of $300 an hour. And it's kind of suspicious to them when you're not. It, that's something that you don't hear a lot is there are companies that will look at you charging $150 an hour and you have 10 years of experience and they'll go, I don't want to bring this person in because that doesn't make sense. And they'll actually bring in the more expensive consultant because they assume that there's something wrong with you because you're not charging as much. I kid you not. It's weird. It's just the way it works. So once you hit that level five, you sort of have a double-edged sword. Number one, you're expected by the companies that can afford you, you're expected to charge more. However, the more you charge, the fewer companies that you can approach and get anything out of. So what do you do? What I do as a consultant is I'm only booked at my top rate about 40% of the year. What do I do with all the rest of the hours? Well, sometimes I'll actually book out for lower and I'll do that with startups or small businesses when they have something really interesting that I think, hey, this is an interesting project. I just want to work on it and I'll take a little bit of a bump down in order to do the project. Or sometimes I get a showcase project where a company, it's not very big, but that project, when I pull it off, is going to look amazing on my bio or in my body of work. And so those are the types of projects that I'll often, I got a ton of open hours now because I'm making the majority of my living off of one client or two clients who are paying me very well at the high end of my range. And so I'll take one or two lower paying clients. And the nice thing about that is now I have a mix. And so if one of the big clients goes away, eh, I, I still have good revenue streams while I'm searching for another client to pay me at that top end of the range. And so I'm not, you know, struggling or scrambling to try to find that client. So that's the thing about tiering your rates and potentially going after smaller companies who are going to pay you less, but making sure that you have those main companies that are going to 
pay you very well for your time. And then taking a few of the smaller ones at a lower rate so that you have a little bit more revenue stability. That's not a bad thing to have. So not just different rates on your rate card, but also maybe tailor your pitch to take on one or two smaller clients. No, they won't pay you at the top end of your range, but like I said, they stabilize your revenue and income so you are more resilient as a consultant to losing one or two clients. That's not a bad thing. It's going to help you long term. And remember, every time you slam dunk a project, that small client might be the person who refers you to your next big client. It also looks amazing on your portfolio. All your projects can't be for Fortune 500 companies. And so having two, three, four showcase projects and then 10 smaller projects to fill in your portfolio, that's important. And so there are benefits to taking a lower rate from time to time. Just don't undercut yourself. Make it clear that this is a one-off and that you're doing it for the project and ask them to keep this rate confidential because if it gets out, you may have undermined your ability to charge your full rate to larger clients if they find out that you've been booking out to a small company for a very tiny rate. So these are things that you might wanna do, but shh, don't tell anyone what that rate is. So hopefully this has helped you out, whether you're in the data engineering, machine learning engineering, or data scientist role, hopefully this has helped you figure out what you're gonna set your prices at and which companies you should be targeting to land as clients to make those companies, uh, companies that can afford you or companies that are going to give you the best opportunity to, like I said, make a diverse revenue stream that's resilient over the long run.